Hello, and welcome to Lab to Launch, the seminar series for researchers interested in pursuing entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Sarah Jane Murdoch, the Administrative Project Coordinator for the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UT Dallas and the Operations Manager for the Venture Mentoring Service of North Texas. As we move through today's session, I invite you to post questions in the Q&A box for our guest speaker to answer. Brian Chambers returns to interview our guest speaker for today's session, Walter Voigt. Dr. Voigt is a Dallas-based entrepreneur at the, head, at the head of Adaptive 3D, which sells proprietary polymer resins. He's a technical founder and leader, having joined the company full-time in May 2017 after receiving tenure from UT Dallas in the Material Science and Engineering Department. And now, here's Brian Chambers and Walter Voigt. Thanks so much, SJ. It's really great to be back. Um, I'm very excited for the session today and excited to uh, evaluate what's been happening with uh, Dr. Voigt and Adaptive 3D. I think it's a very exciting story, perhaps many of us know a little bit about. When I first began my career, my involvement at UT Dallas, uh, I had an interim office at the Venture Development Center. And uh, Dr. Walter Voigt also uh, has been working out of the Venture Development Center for quite some time. And with that, I got a, a sneak peek very early on on what Adaptive 3D was doing um, and was constantly running, uh, colliding with Dr. Voigt in the hallways and grabbing uh, updates. It's been a story that I've been following for quite some time now. And I think a lot of the community at UT Dallas and beyond has been aware that uh, Dr. Voigt's been working on a very exciting startup. It's been getting a lot of great traction. And so I'd like to hopefully demystify some of that for the audience today. And uh, first and foremost, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Walter Voigt. Um, and by really kicking off with a question to you, Dr. Voigt, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where did you grow up and have you always been into science the way that uh, the way that you envisioned it would play out in your life and in your career today. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, first off, just thank you guys for this opportunity to come here and share, you know, a bit, a bit of my life story and Adaptive's life story and my time at the university. Um, have just been thrilled with the support from Capital Factory, from UT Dallas, from trips to China together. And uh, it's, it's neat to see how a lot of these threads uh, come come together. Um, in that vein, um, I'm, I'm an immigrant. We get the job done. Um, I was actually born in Cologne, Germany, and um, my mom was a, a Fulbright studying over in Europe where she met my father. And uh, we moved to the States uh, before I could talk or do anything useful, um, but grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. I was born a dual citizen, an American and, and German citizen. Um, went to public school in Charleston, South Carolina and uh, came out to UT Dallas as uh, the first class of Eugene McDermott scholars in 2001, was kind of really excited and, and engaged with this vision that the McDermott family and the leadership at UT Dallas had set for recruiting students and, and building a vision based on some of the, the transformational stuff that Texas Instruments had done here in, in the area, um, developing integrated circuits and, and really pushing semiconductor processing and then weaving in this next generation of, of science and research and entrepreneurship um, kind of into the story of Dallas. And that compelled me to come to UTD instead of going to an Ivy League school or, or, or a big engineering school that at the time was, was maybe better known. Um, and that's where a lot of this really launched. Um, and then to quickly get to the present, I finished an undergrad and a master's degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. Um, Wrote a, wrote a paper, the only paper that Bill Gates ever published before he uh, dropped out of school to found Microsoft was setting the upper bound for the so-called pancake problem. And uh, Dr. Sudborough, a professor in, in computer science and I and a team uh, beat that uh, as, as a master's student back here at UTD, which is exciting. Um, but I'd also been working at Zyvex, uh, one of the great startup stories here in the Dallas area that was doing work in nanotechnology. And that combined with a stint at Los Alamos really pushed me into material science in graduate school at Georgia Tech. Um, got my PhD, then was recruited back uh, to come to UT Dallas and, and be a young faculty member. Um, had founded the company back in Georgia, so moved it back here. Uh, got some money from DARPA, got tenure, uh, and then left for what was going to be a short stint to build out a management team. And uh, it kind of snowballed into where we are today. 
Well, awesome. And and where we are today is you are the founder and, and CEO of Adaptive 3D. And uh, we'll we'll get into this more throughout the um, throughout the, the discussion today. But what is it that you're working on? Um, what's the vision for uh, Adaptive 3D? Well, uh, our job is to bring 21st century materials manufacturing to the world. Um, today, how we make plastics and how we make rubbers is, is outdated. We're using some of the same injection molding and blow molding and extrusion technologies that were known 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And uh, what we've done is developed a series of proprietary specialty chemicals that when you shine light on them, they will harden into plastics and rubbers, but at the feature size of that patterned light. And we use Texas Instruments DLP chips, the little micro mirrors that drive home theater cinema projectors to pattern that light at feature sizes uh, that as thick as a human hair or much, much thinner. And so by scaling those technologies, we can so significantly reduce the density and increase the strength to weight ratio of plastics and rubbers that we can begin re-envisioning how the world's plastics and rubbers are made. And we've designed some of the, the software, the hardware, and the underlying materials to help make this, this multiple evolutions of, of technology development happen. Um, and that will make parts cheaper, tougher, greener, more sustainable, and, and really drive this profound change in manufacturing driven by Texas Instruments DLP chips. Well, fantastic. You obviously couldn't have done this without uh, the lab and the support of your lab that you've been running. Talk to us about the lab that you have and the role that it's really played along this particular journey. U UTD has been pivotal in this, it really is a lab to launch. So the, the title of this whole series is, is perfect. Um, I've got today, you know, more than 10 graduate students that in, in my, my extended sabbatical here are all co-mentored by other great faculty colleagues uh, back at UTD. Uh, but over the last uh, half decade to decade, I've run a lab that's bringing in millions of dollars per year in, in a lot of cases of extramural research funding. Uh, that is supporting flexible electronics, 3D printing, implantable medical devices, artificial intelligence, and some of the pioneering graduate students that have driven um, some of the technology development. The ones that have graduated have gone on to do fantastic things. My first graduate student, Taylor Ware, went off and did a postdoc at AFRL, wrote a first author science paper, was a faculty colleague here at, at UTD for a number of years, um, and just got hired away at, at Texas A&M. So we were thrilled to have him back, sad to lose him, uh, but he's he's developing a great career in his own right. Um, other students have been NSF graduate fellows, have gone on to work at, at McKinsey and Bain, gotten um, you know all sorts of prestigious fellowships, um, faculty positions. Jonathan Reeder um, just got a faculty position out in Oregon uh, a few weeks ago, which we're really excited about. Melanie Ecker is faculty now at, at UNT. Um, a number of other students started other startups. We've spun six or seven startups out of the lab over the last decade or so, and a number of my former students are running those. And so we, we've really tried to build this inclusive, diverse environment that's that's a crucible for good ideas. And so in, in a lot of labs and a lot of jobs, there's all this pressure and the, this pressure to publish, this pressure to raise money. And, and I think we've been really fortunate from some of our, our funding agencies, DARPA, the McDermott family, uh, some big NIH and NSF uh, grants, that our, our pressure has been more on getting the, the fundamental science right and that real drive to, to be scientifically rigorous. And I think a lot of labs do that, strive for that, but can often get caught in the rat race of, of publish and perish. And we were just, we were really lucky to kind of be at that edge where the ideas, the materials, the partners that we had um, helped our technologies um, in growing areas like 3D printing, like flexible electronics. Um, we had fantastic corporate support from Halliburton, Texas Instruments, GlaxoSmithKline, um, among many others that really helped catalyze problem solving. And a lot of what we have today at Adaptive is built on that, that many year quest to get the technology right and, and not rush that. So you had mentioned you just you just referred to in your last couple of statements about a lot of the funding 
that you've been able to achieve, your lab's been able to achieve these partnerships, the funding that's gone on to, to power a lot of the, the science and the research. How, exactly how much funding has grant funding and research uh, funding has gone into the research process uh, ahead of really catalyzing adaptive 3D and, and choosing to, to go to market? Uh, thanks. It's it's a hard question to account for everything, um, given all the scholarships that many of my students in the past have have been awarded and a lot of the time and effort. Um, but it, but it's been tens of millions of dollars collectively that have gone into the research portfolio that has launched uh, uh, the Qualia set of companies that's launched Adaptive, that's launched Aries, that launched Pascalor, um, and that supported you know my great students in in their careers. Um, Big chunks of this funding came from the McDermott family, the founders of Texas Instruments, um, from DARPA. Um, just from DARPA alone, we've we've received more than five or six million dollars in, in funding through my DARPA Young Faculty Award, um, uh, various phase two SBIRs. Uh, we have a, a big ongoing grant right now at the university in artificial intelligence, trying to understand how humans and AI solve problems in virtual but open worlds. And in the time of COVID, when lots more people are virtual, uh, th this is ever more interesting as the lines between reality and kind of a virtual reality and augmented reality uh, start to blend. And so at the university, that's a perfect example. These are pre-competitive technologies, let's say for adaptive, um, that are starting to solve some of the underlying algorithmic uh, machine learning problems that, that we hope over the next half decade will be translated to more effectively and efficiently manufacturing parts. So you're here at your lab, you've got awesome students, you've got great partners, you've got some funding coming in that's, you know, that's supporting uh, the underlying research and the science about what's going on. How was it actually cutting a deal with the university to license the technology? This is um, known if, you're, if you don't do it oftentimes uh, or haven't done it before, it's a bit of a mysterious process, and it also differs from, to some extent, from one university to the next to the next. How is it at UT Dallas cutting a deal, and what might you be able to share with others that are in a similar situation or have the opportunity, maybe now or in the future, commercializing technology out of UT Dallas? What might they need to know about? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's usually a, a sore spot at a lot of universities. Uh, which makes it hard for companies then to go in and deal with major Fortune 500 companies because th they're always these, these remnant hooks and ties back to the university uh, where rules are different and it's become prohibitive. Um, it's not always been perfect at UTD, but the great thing is the leadership has been really willing to get it right um, over at least a decade. And so uh, I remember early on um, there were a number of, of warts and issues and uh, we, we commissioned some efforts to look at what the top 20 universities across the country were doing. And uh, we were involved in, in some of the early days um, in presenting how Georgia Tech and Stanford and MIT and Carnegie Mellon and, and some others dealt with tech transfer. And I'm, I'm really happy to say that, that, well, first of all, Carnegie Mellon did, did of, of all these, we think, you know, one of the best jobs of handling university-sponsored research. Um, University of Michigan had a really good program that, that Bob Robb, you know, one of the pioneers in our tech transfer department had helped create. And so we did take some of the best practices from other established universities and really built UTD's tech transfer process to follow those. Um, and like, like in the Carnegie Mellon system, uh, there, there's a desire from UTD leadership for founders and inventors to go and, and change the world. And I think in, in tech transfer offices, you can prioritize you know, monetization of licensing fees today, or you can prioritize in franchising your scholars and academics and, and leaders to go to make the world a better place and hope that a lot of the residuals that come from that, hiring students, bringing in grant funding, building up the, the local GDP of the area, then, you know, kind of pay off in spades. And that's what UTD has, has chosen to do through partnering with, with the Richardson IQ, um, and other kind of entrepreneur areas, the, the Blackstone Launchpad and Capital Factory. Um, I think UTD has just gone out of its way to build this community of scholars that are enfranchised to go make the world a better place. Kind of like Mrs. McDermott told us, you know, come to Dallas and get smart, 
go elsewhere and get smarter and then come back and make Dallas, make Texas and make the world a better place. And when Miss McDermott tells you to do something, you say, yes, ma'am, and then go do it. Um, and on, on that note, I'm going to kick that back to you, Brian, to, to follow Mrs. McDermott's charge. Um, Capital Factory and, and Blackstone have been key parts of this story of, of UTD. Maybe you could comment a little bit on, on what they've done to build this environment that makes tech transfer and entrepreneurship so appealing uh, here in the Dallas area. Yeah, thanks. It's a great, it's a great question. I'll, um, I'll, I'll chat about it a little bit and, you know, and share that, uh, that, that both of these are, un are unique communities in themselves. And there's one thing that I can attest to being, you know, uh, an, an entrepreneur having started a startup and gone a, a couple of times from, from start to exit or start to failure, it is critical that whoever you are and wherever you're at in your journey, that you have community to support you. Nobody gets to do anything so consequential by themselves without a team, without mentors, without advisors. And all of these assets and resources are largely organized and perhaps in some cases the best in the country, uh, uh, you know, organizing some of these, re uh, these resources. And so I think it's been a wonderful strategic alignment and a bolt on to uh, the awesome students, the science, the education that's that's occurring here. But most importantly, really serving as a bridge for an entrepreneur, whether it's uh, licensing uh, technology from the university or it's a student just starting something or an alumni starting something, helping bridge that to real industry. And so um, that I think has been uh, is, is been a, it, it's going really great, and I think uh, the best has yet to come in terms of the alignment that UT Dallas, as you had mentioned, um, has put really substantial efforts into building this alignment and creating new new types of innovative partnerships that will help everybody from yourself to the to a freshman who's uh, coming in. Uh, to college for the very first time with a new idea on their mind. And so I think it's been, um, you know, it's been been a wonderful experience. And candidly, I didn't have any of this when I went to college. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful, but a little bit jealous that I didn't have all these organized resources uh, and the breadth of resources available to aspiring entrepreneurs. So I think it's, um, you know, thanks, you know, thanks for bringing that up, Walter. I think it's, I think it's an, it's, Tremendous. It's uh, something that a lot of times people have to lean into, but those that are real serious about, you know, about doing this uh, bridging into industry um, have more places and more resources to rely on than ever before. So I think that's that's awesome. Um, Walter, what other hacks as you're commercializing uh, adaptive? What other hacks, what other resources, maybe besides the ones you've already mentioned, have been have you been able to leverage? Are there any others that come to mind? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think first and foremost, it's this uh, ability to be hyper transparent about what you're doing with university leadership and with the tech transfer office. Um, a lot of times in business, you want to build a business based on asymmetric information. You know, you know things that your partners and competitors don't know, and you can then go and, and monetize that. Um, but I think it's different with the university. If you see the university as an impediment to your commercialization, and there's this wall that's put up there, um, it becomes really difficult to get things done. There are lots of rules and regulations. The, the UT system is, is amazing in a lot of respects. It's got one of the largest endowments in the world of any university. Um, it's got you know great ability to help defend and protect intellectual property. You know, should there come to be disputes down the road, you know, it's one thing to sue, uh, you know, an emerging high growth company that's that's valued at 50 or 100 million dollars. It's another to have a defendant, you know, be the UT system and its endowment. And so there's a lot of great support in having the university's story uh, behind you. And I think early on, uh, a lot of faculty and graduate students think, oh, it's all this, this hard work. I want to get what I can out of the university as cheaply as possible. And um, you go to all this effort to kind of protect and hide things and separate things. Um, and there are black lines about what you can and can't do with state university resource, state university, uh, state resources, university resources, federal funds and startups. And you've got to be really clear where that line exists when it comes to IP and students. And a lot of times there are gray lines. 
and uh, being very transparent with the Office of Research, letting them know what you're doing, how you're making decisions, how you're interacting with students, proactively managing conflicts of interest. Uh, a lot of people say this conflict of interest is such a pain, it's such a burden. I've got to tell UTD what I'm doing oh, every year. Uh, well, you know, I've, I've gone every, you know, every quarter. I work with Connor Wakeman, who's been fantastic at UTD, to kind of proactively define where are the issues that could look like conflicts. And, you know, how we end up in the Dallas Morning News for the wrong reasons is that if these conflicts aren't managed appropriately, and often the perception of misdoing, even if the reality is just fine, is enough for things to get really bad. And, and at best, be hours in just dealing with that. And so, you know, one of the biggest hacks is defining those lines, coming up with a win-win, and, you know, giving the university its due, giving it its share, and then incentivizing everyone you work with to go and, and, and be successful. And I, I know that UTD is, is willing and able to do that because we've got several companies that have now launched and negotiated separate licenses from the university that are all win-wins if and as we're able to commercialize things and create value. Um, the second hack, and then I'll, I'll kick it back to you, um, is really in for, for especially for faculty and graduate students, don't don't overemphasize the importance of the first IP that comes out of the university. You know, it's it's when you're publishing, you're trying to get into science and nature and, and great journals. There's a lot of this pop science and that you've you've got to be the best in the world at what you do and, and do something that's great. And a, a lot of times in industry, you know, that's great for IP, but it's easy for companies to get around some of the, the more pop science -y IP. The really strong IP is when you can understand a, a pathway to market commercially and you can begin to protect that from a lot of different angles. And so a lot of times the early IP from the university gives you great splash damage, it gives you a good priority date, and it's, it's a great way to, to, to start. But then that next wave or that third wave of IP that is built around protecting a business is often a lot more defensible. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point where we're defending our IP in court yet, but it's probably coming. Um, and we're working with some some great IP counsel locally and, and in DC. Um, and I, I think really understanding that that IP story and understanding its importance to to technology companies is a great skill to have coming out of the university. And so if you can get those two right, the management of IP and not overemphasizing the importance of early IP um, and then being transparent. Those are two of the biggest sticking blocks with, with faculty and graduate students in kind of getting a technology heavy company right. And we certainly didn't get it right uh, the first time right off the bat. It took you know a couple passes, but now I think we, we understand that well and it's, it's helping accelerate working with the university to do great things. That's awesome. Um, I really appreciate that that guidance to to others, especially especially on the transparency front. This is obviously a reoccurring theme throughout always building a business and every stage of building a business uh, with your you know your your investors, your key stakeholders. Uh, so I think that's that's fabulous advice and uh, shameless plug real quick. Um, you know, there is also another opportunity, other resources. They're not available for you, Walter, and Adaptive because you've already raised too much money in your process and your story. But Adaptive has been a part of, an in, you know, a new decision and a new process. You had mentioned already the, you know, some of the areas of the key strategic plan under the new university leadership uh, to contribute to the local GDP, to create more entrepreneurs. These are part of always the, the core values of the university. We've got a new pitch competition that's coming out where we are awarding a hundred thousand uh, dollars to a to a new venture, formed or not formed, will ultimately need to form. That's going to commercialize new technology out of the university. Um, and adaptive has largely been a part of why we uh, like to create more adaptive three D stores university faculty, our PhDs, our students, the opportunity to, to win. So we're excited about that. Those applications uh, are open at the moment. So if for anyone that's listening, um, a new hack to win some resources, uh, you can learn about those at innovation.utdallas.edu. But um, Walter, I just want to let you know that Adaptive 3D was in our minds as we're crafting this. How do we create more stories, more opportunities like this? 
Uh, lastly, last question, I'd like to certainly like to talk about how is it going today? What are you working through? But before I do, again, as we talked about, nobody gets to do this on your on their own. You've already referenced some of the partners and the students and the research that has been so critical to you. But have there been any mentors or advisors that you've leaned on along the way? Have they played a role in your story today? Absolutely. I mean, you, you say you don't get anywhere without standing on the shoulders of giants. And it is so true both in business and in, in academia. And so in the earlier days, a lot more of the partners were academics, colleagues and mentors, and ranging from, from Bruce Ganade and, and Joe Pancrazio in the, the Office of, of Research, um, to close collaborations with Hongbing Liu in the Mechanical Engineering Department, with Ron Smaldone in the Chemistry Department, with Manuel Cuvedo in the Material Science Department, uh, j just at UTD, uh, Rob Renneker and Mike Kilgard over in, in biomedical engineering. Um, and then more broadly, you know, faculty colleagues, whether they were DARPA young faculty awardee colleagues um, at Georgia Tech, at Harvard, at MIT, at Stanford, at Michigan, at Purdue, um, in Tennessee, uh, all, all over the country and all over the world. Um, th this academic community is so important. Um, I've sent students to the University of Tokyo and to Zhejiang University um, near the West Lake in China and you know, got a student over in Ali Schmidt's lab over in, in Europe right now, and um, so sent soaks to the UK. Um, and it's it's just this, this mishmash of ideas and perspective that's so important. As we move over the business, it's a, a lot of the mentors and colleagues that have done it before. Um, John Jaggers is, is, is a close friend now. Um, he was a partner, senior partner at Seven Rosen, one of the big VC firms here in the Dallas area and um, has through his uh, relationship with Dan Patterson, one of our key investors, we've gotten to know him and helped craft a kind of venture fundable story. Um, you know, another great kind of VC minded fellow, um, John Cunningham up in the Seattle area has been a part of a lot of big deals up there through Clearfur, um, and they've been kind of on the individual business kind of VC side of things. Um, it's been board members from Applied Materials and from DSM at Adaptive. It's been key technical partners at a lot of the world's great manufacturing companies and, and OEMs, um, whether that's at companies like Nike or Halliburton or Ford or GM or Bose or Honeywell or Schlumberger or Serta or Safran or Eaton or Uber. The list goes on and on and on. There are key technical and business leaders um, who, with whom we've interacted with and, and built perspective around, and that's helped shape how we bring products to market. Awesome. Well, give us a snapshot, Walter, of how is it going today and what are you most excited about? What can you share with us that's on the horizon? And how do you think about kind of the, the magnitude of this opportunity? What are you most excited about? Yeah, that's a great question. And this might be a time to pull up a few slides. I don't know if you guys can see slides, but I had a couple couple slides prepared with some neat uh, graphics. Um, can you guys see if, if those are up? We sure can. Great, great. Well, um, I'll, I'll take that question back to the nerdy material science side of things first, and then I'll end it on the business side. But one of my favorite ways to kind of segment the world of, of materials is something called an Ashby chart. Uh, Michael Ashby talking about the shoulders of giants is as a pioneering a professor out from the UK, and he would plot all the materials of the world on these orthogonal properties axes. And in this case, this is how stiff a material is, the Young's modulus, as a function of a metric which is relative cost per unit volume. So basically, how cheap and lightweight can something be? And even though I'm a big polymers guy, concrete is this noticeable uh, deviation on this graph. It is such a good material in terms of its strength, to kind of cost and density ratio. It's amazing. Con concrete is one of the world's most engineered materials because it's so far off axis. If you look at how the world today is constructed, it's concrete, it's brick, it's stone, it's woods, it's a lot of foams, polyethylene, polypropylene, EVA. It's a lot of these really inexpensive materials per properties. Now you've got your specialty metals and your specialty polymers and your high-end rubbers, but it's hard to really scale them to assemble and shape the world. And so there's this huge opportunity, this big white space in this chart of materials that don't exist today uh, that we're really excited about. And, and where the adaptive portfolio of materials fits in is providing rubber solutions and providing plastic solutions 
that are kind of in this critical zone of opportunity to be able to produce materials that can't be produced by other other methods or or another way without you know getting too technical again to look at this another set of ashby charts is this is a stress strain curve or how strong versus how stretchy materials are and it's prohibitive to get materials that are strong enough and stretchy enough to solve real world applications and the ability to take really good plastics and rubbers and then use micro architecture to 3D print them shifts them down into this space or another way to look at it is strength versus density as we make materials lighter and lighter we don't have to trade off strength for density and so we can use a lot less material to build exciting products and and that leads to this fundamental transformation um, in the way that we can produce materials and goods and so skipping right right to the thesis and then i'll kick it back over to you uh, there's this thing called moore's law that a lot of you who know a lot about semiconductor processing and, and technology are probably familiar with. Uh, since the 1900s, the Babel, uh, Babbage's analytical engine, you know, all the way up to modern times, we've had this exponential increase in complexity per time per cost. So this is basically how many calculations per second per thousand dollars can you get out of wafers? And, and what we're proposing is a, is a Moore's law for materials processing. Instead of calculations, it's surface area or, or internal surface area. So using micro patterning of light with DLP chips, how, how fractalized or how much internal complexity can we build per time per cost? And we see this orders of magnitude scale over the next 20 years that will fundamentally transform and reshape how the world builds rubbers and builds plastics and, and maybe metals if some of the core materials technologies can can be solved there. Um, but so that's that's components like mattresses and oil wells and shoes and cars and planes and medical devices all being made, you know, one one pixel at a time, much, much thinner than a human hair, but it's not really one pixel at a time. It's hundreds of trillions of pixels per second being patterned at these resolutions to re-architect and re-engineer the strength to weight ratio of plastics and rubbers. And well, we're not there, um, but but it is a really exciting story and process to be a part of that these fundamental technologies, TI's DLP technology, great materials that can be cured in open air and have fantastic properties like what Adaptive has, and then the ability to work with an international global manufacturing supply chain to get us there um, is, is really exciting. Um, and so those are the pieces that fit together that are underlying our, our Series B fundraise, which is ongoing right now, and then the future growth in adaptive 3D. That's fantastic. Walter, have you ever read, um, and if you do, you, if you happen to know who uh, the firm Andreessen Horowitz out of the West Coast, uh, Mark Andreessen, arguably the best and most famous VC in the game, uh, wrote a recent blog post called It's Time to Build. Have you ever read that? And are you familiar with the movement now that is It's Time to Build? I haven't read that blog post, but I'm very familiar with that movement being where we are in this scaled additive space. And and it is spot on. I think that that we have, I mean, not to get political, there's lots of stuff happening in the world today and, and lots of bad news and polarized news. And, you know, people have to pick an issue and decide maybe sometimes often to two very extremes how they feel. And in manufacturing and building and creating, this is really a place where a lot of us can come together and re-architect and, and re-engineer, you know, how the world is, is made. And that's really exciting. If you take plastics broadly, um, right now, injection molded plastics, blow molded plastics, there's so much waste in that part. And if we can get in and micro architect, even the thinnest wall of a water bottle and use 80% less material through these intricate micro architectures, um, we get these ultra high surface area materials that are then much easier to recycle, that use a lot less material at the onset, are lighter weight, are better for the environment. And, and if you take, take the green movement, a lot of times you have to pick, hey, let's make something green or let's be a capitalist and make money. And so you're often asked to choose, well, what do you want to do? But the really exciting technologies are the ones where you can get better margins at higher volume in a fundamentally different technology that allows us to use less of a better material to solve a problem. 
it's higher margin, it's less waste. And by, by deploying technology, I think there are some really interesting problems that, that today we're forced to make these, these you know, sacrifices and trades that aren't so good um, where, where technology can come to the rescue. And it's that creative destruction that, that Joseph Schumpeter might talk about. And the world is so exciting. And then the university, the ecosystem we have at UT Dallas is again, that, that crucible of good ideas where these kinds of vectors can be launched from the university that can fundamentally reshape how the world builds and makes parts. And, well, and we're humbled and thrilled to be part of this. What's so exciting, so Andreessen Horowitz was largely known for creating the thesis called Software is Eating the World. And while that is still probably true to a good extent, this new thesis has really come out in the wake of COVID called It's Time to Build. It's time to get back to our manufacturing roots as a country and be the best in the world at this. It's time to build is the new investing thesis. And um, just here in this discussion and when reviewing your slides and hearing you talk, I think we've got to make an effort to uh, get you connected with Andreessen Horowitz. So I'm going to take that opportunity. I'm going to share that blog post, let you read it, and then work on that uh, for your Series B plus and beyond. Um, but with that, um, two more quick questions before we turn it over. We close down. I know we're, we're running short on time here. Can you very quickly share with us, with us maybe one product if there's anything that's not you know that's that that's not overly confidential uh if there is we can certainly move on let us know but tell us about one product that you're excited about that you've been able to create these new materials and create a prototype or a product that's going to change the game is there anything um that comes to mind yeah great if, if my slides are still up you can you can see another geeky chart and then i'll talk about the product behind it but this little red dot right here is a product called elastic tough rubber 90. And it's, it's one of the world's best, and by best, in material science, best, whenever someone says something's the best, you have to take that with a grain of salt because there are all of these orthogonal axes on how to judge materials. And so best is application specific, it's environment specific, it could be cost specific. And so in our case, when we say best, it's the best combination of being able to be rapidly 3D printed in the scalable, TI DLP based world that we've talked about so we can make millions or billions of these parts uh, very quickly. Um, and it's the best combination of both uh, strength and stiffness as measured in this chart by the shore a hardness and strain as measured by the ability to stretch to 200% or more. And this this box, this dotted line is a key target space that comes from our customers in medical and transportation and in industrial and in oil and gas and in consumer segments of the need for rubbers that look and feel like Elastilan or Avalon or PBAX or other really great uh, TPUs, thermoplastic polyurethanes or, or TPEs, yet can be rapidly additively manufactured and microstructured to get to these strength to weight ratio wins and gains that we're talking about. And so I'm, I'm really happy to say that after, after years in the lab and IP that started at UT Dallas and then was built upon an adaptive, um, we launched this last November at the, the biggest 3D printing trade show in the world, a form next over in Frankfurt. And we've been building market traction over this past year to do some really cool things with these stiff, tough, strain tolerant rubbers that touch on consumer products, on medical devices, on automotive and industrial parts, and on components uh, for oil wells. Well, fantastic. I think we've got some questions in the queue, but I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off with one to one or two questions uh, to get in here very quickly, Walter. If you, so you've been successful raising some seed funding, some grant funding, some series A funding. You just referenced your series B that you're working to bring to a close. With regards to fundraising and financing a, a, a business, what advice can you give to um, what can you give to aspiring entrepreneurs that may want to follow suit and commercialize a business? Uh, so that's the first question, and um, and then the second question I have, we'll we'll you know take these very quickly so we can get to the others. Is make can you make a five year or a ten year prediction about adaptive three D? Do you have anything high conviction that you'd be willing to say in five years or eight years or ten years, whatever it is? this will be true. I'd love to know what's on your mind. So let me my high, a high conviction prediction. Let me start with the second one first, and then I'll come back to the, the advice. Um, so, you know, as, as a business, you, you want to hate to make predictions because you hate to be wrong. 
but you have to make predictions to set a vision for how the world ought to be. Um, and so we, we've built a bottoms up forecasted adaptive through current deals we have and projected deals with great Fortune 1000, Fortune 500, Fortune 200 companies that are key partners. Um, we're hoping to hit $150 million in revenue by 2025 um, and be limited at that point by our ability to penetrate new markets with our ability to mass micro architect materials. Um, if we got really lucky and threaded the needle, um, it could be before that. Um, I think if, if things didn't go well, I think that the, the fundamental technology that we're building this on is the right idea. It's right for the time, it's right for the technology, and there's a big timing risk to getting there. But at the end of the day, good ideas win. And building upon this, this enormous investment in DLP that Texas Instruments, that our, our benefactors, the McDermott family and TI has built over so many years, we've got these powerful manufacturing tools that can build and, and, and fabricate something, build the future. And so I, I do think that thesis is going to win out. Um, I'm hopeful to have a seat at the table uh, at and through Adaptive um, as these big decisions happen um, through us and or through future partners. Um, but I'm confident that this is the technology that will make it fundamentally, given my, my decade as a material science professor. Um, we, we funded work out at Caltech with Julia Greer's group, who's a fantastic sort of micro architecture materials researcher with Hongbing Liu at UT Dallas, who's got some one of a kind equipment in the world here at UTD. And, and I think we have this, this really interesting understanding of micro architected materials and processability that's not gonna die, even if adaptive were to, were to fold up and die. Um, and that's really exciting. And I do think that we have the right team, uh, the, the right researchers, the right business folks, uh, the right synthetic organic PhD chemists, and the right global manufacturing partners to pull maybe all of this off or at least a piece of this off to fundamentally reshape how the world is making plastics and rubbers. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Awesome. So very quickly, we've got a couple of questions in the queue. We need to get to them, but your number one piece of advice when it comes to fundraising for those that can't go do this without scaling uh, financing through private investors, not just grants, What's the one piece of advice you have for others out there? It's really to know your audience, know who you're talking to. It's really easy to get caught in PowerPoint mode, building these, put, putting all this time and blood and sweat and tears into a slide deck um, without really knowing who the audience is gonna be. And taking that time to know who you're presenting to, who you're pitching to, and then going back and rehashing, repivoting, thinking about what they're interested in, and then tailoring it to them is, is so important. Because if you can't take the time to do that, you know how, how and why are they gonna give you hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars if you can't take that bit of time? And it gets, it gets overwhelming sometimes if you've gotta go and talk to 40 people to get one deal done. But that's, that's, that's part of the effort. That's part of the speed dating uh, that's, that's there. And so to close on this advice, there, there are really several different audiences. And early on, this kind of angel or high net worth individual or sometimes private equity, friends and family group of investors, often they're going to invest in you because of who they are. Um, Mary Cook, Mary McDermott Cook is, is a key example of that for us. The, the, the daughter of the founder of Texas Instruments, she has a vision for how the world ought to be and how Dallas ought to be and supported the McDermott Scholars Program and ended up investing in us at an early stage because he said, you know what, you know, through the warts and through the trials and tribulations, I believe in you to go and figure out how to be successful. And that's a really great early partner to have because there's this belief that you can get the job done. As, as you scale then to strategics, then the focus needs to be really on the technology, IP and go to market alignment. Um, and it's your operational capabilities today and how you can scale a revenue stream to be relevant in a near to midterm time frame. And that's really important in how strategics can understand perspective that might shape their business. And then as you move all the way to VCs, um, it's very different. You're not trying to convince a VC how good your technology is. You need to paint a problem in the world that is so big that if that VC can come in with their network and their scholars and their resources that they can be excited about solving that problem. And when they throw their technical experts at you, you know, they have confidence that what you're doing 
you know, is not is close to science fiction and close to magic, but it's not so much magic that it can't be done. And so you don't want to walk away from a VC meeting having convinced them about how great your technology is. You want to convince them that what you're doing is pure magic and that the market is is so exciting that it warrants them to bring in technical experts to try to disprove, you know, your magic. And if you can get there with VCs, um, I think that's how you get access to some of the great capital, like from um, Andreessen Horowitz and, and others, to really go and change the world. I love that. That's fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to SJ. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Voigt and Ryan, for today's session. It's been really amazing hearing about Adaptive 3D and the journey. Um, our next lab to launch session will be in two weeks with Dr. Ted Price who will be talking about Circe Therapeutics. Um, and just as a reminder, the deadline that Brian mentioned um, for the applications for the Big Idea competition are September 20th. There's also a link in the chat for that. Uh, thank you all everyone and hope to see you in the booster session in just a few seconds. Thanks.